Hello everyone, um, this screencast is going to go over a couple of things from chapter 8, or one thing from chapter 8 and one thing from chapter 9, uh, specifically how to use the equations, uh, the kinematic rotational equations, um, as well as setting up a torque uh, problem. Um, so uh, hopefully this, this helps as you are finalizing things on your homework and um, and your quiz. Um, so I just wanted to, to start off with this uh, table, uh, table 8.1, that shows the relationship between the rotational and linear motion kinematic equations. Um, they, they're, they're basically the same, just in angular terms. So we can apply the same types of um, a problem solving to our problems that we used with uh, the linear motion kinematic equations. And um, as an example of this, uh, using one of the uh, concept questions from section 8.3, um, this, is, this, is, this is a just a sample problem. And this is how I would approach ro rotational motion equi uh, problems as well as linear motion. Um, so we'll just just read this just because I guess uh, a rotational a rotating wheel has a constant angular acceleration. It has an angular velocity of five radians per second at time equals zero seconds, and three seconds later has an angular velocity of nine radians per second. What is the angular displacement of the wheel during the three second interval? So the first thing that I would do is go through and I've kind of set it up here and write down what I the, the values that I have. So initially, so at the very beginning at time equals zero, we have a angular velocity of five radians per second. Then three seconds later or delta T, um, which is three seconds, we have a final velocity or a final angular velocity of nine radians per second. And what it is asking for is the angular displacement, which is the delta theta, or the change in that angular uh, length, I guess. Yeah. Um, so that angular distribution. So what we can then do is go through and look at our table 8.1 and pick out the equation that has all of this information, that has an initial velocity, initial angular velocity, a final angular velocity, a t or delta t, and a delta theta. And if we do that, we can we can analyze basically all of them. Um, and because they're pretty much all related, you can you can play around with them. And if you um, solve one thing in one equation, then you can probably put it in another equation and uh, solve one other thing and put in another equation. Or if you can find one equation that works, then fabulous. And that one equation here is this 8.6. So we have theta, or the change in theta, is equal to 1 half times the initial angular velocity plus the, the final angular velocity, all times the change in time. And that gives us, um, if we plug in then the numbers, we get 21 radians. Um, like I said, the, the, the process that I would use to solve any of these equations is to write out what we have to, and then to, to write out what the problem is looking for and then look at this list of equations that we have and see which one would work best, see which one, which uh, equation has the variables that I have and which one has the, the variables that I want to find. Um, in this case, we could also use 8.4 to solve for the angular acceleration because we have the angular velocity, the final one, and the initial one, and the change in time. So we could solve for the angular acceleration. And then we could use that, say, in 8.8 .8 and solve for theta. Um, so we could do a couple of things. But again, finding the most simple one is obviously simple, lur. Um, so hopefully that, that helps um, organize your thoughts and, and helps you go through um, things that, that will, will help you solve these rotational chromatic equations.
if you have any other questions about this, please let me know. So we're going to move on to a concept in chapter nine. Move this. There we go. All right. So for chapter nine, the the concept that I want to want to talk about, there's there's a lot of things in there, um, specifically like the modem of inertia, and um, hopefully those are a little bit more straightforward. The 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 one that I the one concept that I wanted to talk about is this um, sum of torques, which is very similar to the sum of forces, um, and the sum of forces problems that we that we did previously. Um, however, there's some slight differences, and I wanted to point out those differences and how to how to set them up. Um, again, we have uh, we 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 go through and we talk about. Um, that the sum of the torque is equal to I alpha, where I is the moment of inertia and alpha is the angular acceleration of the object. Um, and therefore, we can analyze the problem in this as, as, in this manner that we go through. However, if we want to talk about equilibrium, then we know that if there isn't any rotation, then our sum of the torques are from the external um, forces is equal to zero. And so for any problem, um, that we aren't rotating, we can we can sum those things equal to zero. So here I have a sample rod, um, and it has how many forces do I have on here? One, two, three, four, five forces. So we have um, the center of mass of the rod, which is illustrated by this larger dot, has a center of force mass that points down. To the left of that center of mass, we have a block that has some mass and therefore it has some force that is a distance one away from that center of mass on the left side and then we have two blocks on the right side that are each their own distance away and uh, someone pushing up on the bottom of the rod and so how do we go about and set this up so I, I've listed a couple of steps here that will help you go through um, torque problems like this so the first thing that we do is identify what the problem wants. What does the problem want us to solve? Is it a specific force that it wants us to find? Is it a distance? Is it just a torque? Um, that will help us determine um, what it is that we need to dismiss in our next step. Um, so the wonderful thing about torque is that it has to be about, that when we do our, our sum of the torque equation that it has to be about a pivot point. So we have to s select a pivot point. So that's that's why I say in, in two here. Choose a pivot point that will optimize the things you know, and more importantly, the things you don't know. So let's say, for example, in this um, sample problem that I have, that they don't give us the mass of the rod. Therefore, that makes it a little bit difficult to use the center of mass in our uh, sum of the torque equation. So we can then, oh, excuse me. Anything else going to pop up? Okay, good. So we can then say, well, I'm going to take my pivot. So this is our triangle that's representing a pivot. And I'm going to put that pivot right here. Therefore, when we use the, uh, the equation for torque, um, which is F times the distance, assuming that it's perpendicular, that force is perpendicular to the distance. The distance from the pivot point to the center of mass is zero. Therefore, this force has no effect on the torque. And we can do that anywhere. We can say, you know what? We want our pivot to actually be down here because they don't tell us any information about the force of this block or the mass. So we're going to put it there, and they actually tell us the mass of the rod this time. So... If they don't specifically, if the problem does not specifically tell you where to put your pivot, then you can move your pivot around and and, and say where you want to look at the rotation of this rod. But again, if they say you know, specifically that your pivot has to be at the center of mass, for instance, then, then you have no choice. But ho hopefully they've given you all of the information then that you need to solve whatever it is that they're that they're asking you to solve for, okay. So hopefully those those first two things make sense. Um, 
So figure out what the problem wants you to solve. And if you can, then you can move your, then you can move your pivot around in different places. Um, sometimes it may be like attached to a wall. And so your pivot is, is on the edge. Um, or if it's like stuck between two walls, um, then, then you can put your pivot or if it's like a sign or something that, that it's talking about, then the, the pivot or the hinge is at the edge of your rod. And then you can, um, base everything off the distance and everything off um, from there. Hopefully again, that makes sense. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, number three. Once we've established a, pit, a pivot, or once we know where our pivot is, then establish a positive and minus rotation scheme, and then you can set up your sum of the torque equation. So, for example, if our pivot here is in the middle, um, typically we say that the rotation in the clockwise direction is positive. So here's here's my little symbol for that. Okay, so any force that makes the rod move in that direction, we consider positive. Anything that makes it move in the other direction, we consider it negative. So we can go through and we can look at all of this force, all of these forces. So for instance, this force from this first block, does it make it move clockwise or counterclockwise? It wants to move the rod counterclockwise. So this force is a negative force when we do our sum, and I'll show you in just a second. Let's go on to this. Well, this um, center of mass force doesn't matter because that's where our pivot is. So we can just dismiss that. This force, F2, wants to move the rod downward, which is in a clockwise direction. So we can assume that this is a positive. This hand pushing up is moving it counterclockwise. And so it is a negative force. And then this last one is in the same direction as this F2. And so therefore this rotate, it wants to rotate the rod positive. So he, we end up with an equation that looks like this. Ah! All right. So once we have this equation and this is all equal to zero, I can just put that in there. Um, Now we can go through and solve whatever we need to solve for, which, which what, whatever the problem asks. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So because we're dealing, because with torque we're dealing with rotation, then the positive and minus positives and negatives are not just dependent on which direction the force is acting. Um, for instance, right? These these. These downward forces are not negative, um, or they don't apply negative torque in this situation. They actually apply positive torque, um, just because of how we've how we've set up the problem. Um, wondering if I can let's do let's put our let's let's put our pivot over here and say and do a, a similar thing, okay? So if we put our pivot over here, we're still rotating or still assuming that any force being applied, any torque being applied and making it go clockwise is positive. And so then let's just go through and look at what, what these all are. So now in this situation, if our pivot is over on this, let's say there's a wall here and it's attached. So our hinge is over here. Then F1 is now a positive torque. Now we have to use the center of mass. And that is a positive torque. F2 is also positive. F4 is also positive. And the only negative one is this F3. So we're basically saying that this F3 is, is the one applying a torque that's holding up, holding up the sign. If it's a sign like, or a rod. <laughs> okay, so hopefully that, that helps um, with things. I'll move this back so we don't get confused. Um, if you have further questions, please, please, please um, let me know how I can help. And um, good luck with things. Thanks.